Let's bring him on the show. Patrick Reed Johnson is here. Patrick, so glad to finally get you on the show. This is great. I'm super excited to finally be here. Um, I apologize. I'm, I'm not in my usual space. Uh, I'm at uh, my girlfriend's restaurant because my internet got blown away by the hurricane. Uh, so I had to oh, no. come down and borrow her internet down at the restaurant, Sixth and Vine in Winston Salem. But uh, but it's fine. It's great. But I just hey. you know that's why I'm like. This. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I appreciate appreciate you taking the time to talk of to us. Course. I I have known and, and I we've got uh, over 500 people watching us live right now. Wow! So slap that like button, sh share, get your questions ready for Patrick. Um, I have a big question. I have known yes. about this movie for more than 10 years, and uh, Gary Kurtz was involved in this tell me what and before we actually talk about the actual movie okay why did it sit on a shelf for so long and how did gary kurtz involvement help i assume that helped with clearing some footage possibly because there's footage from star wars in the movie um but what was the journey and what was it because I mean, when i heard about this movie and i think i first heard about it on a website called theforce.net I think that I think that might have been the first report about it back in like I mean probably before we even started shooting possibly when we were just talking about making it. Well, okay, so to answer a, a bunch of questions at the same time, mm -hmm. first of all, um, the reason it sat on, on 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 a shelf for so many years was not because nobody wanted to distribute it. It was because the distributors who wanted it and a lot of them did we're like, okay, you're done, but what do you need? And I'm like, well, we've got about $200,000 worth of music rights we have to pay for. Now, by the way, if you've seen the film, it's about $2 million worth of music in normal terms in a normal movie uh, with, you know, Super Tramp and Queen and Alan Parsons. And I mean, you know, there's 10 CC. I mean, there's so many beautiful songs that we wanted in the film. And because Alan Parsons is a good friend and knew most of these people, and because other people just saw the movie and liked it, like Ringo Starr saw it and said, oh yeah, that, oh, that looks good. Let's, let, you can have the music, you know? <laughs> it was like, <laughs> wow. Uh, it, 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 we had the rights, but we didn't have the money and nobody was willing to pay for the music. They were like, oh, just replace it with sound alikes or, you know, put some score in there or take it out. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. And it took that long for somebody, finally, Eric Wilkinson at MVD, who had been chasing the movie since we showed the like three and a half hour rough cut at Star Wars Celebration 4 in 2008, had been saying, I want this movie. I want this movie. And I kept saying, do you have the money? Do you have the money? Do you have the money? Nope, nope, nope. And finally, in 2020, he, he said, I want this movie. And I said, do you have the money? He said, I do. And so we finally got to pay for the music. I was holding out for the music. And luckily, my investors and all the people involved in the movie were like, finish the movie the way you want to finish it. We believe in it. Don't undercut it. Don't. Because as you've... If, if you've seen the movie, you know why the music is desperately important. And Gary, you know, really understood why we needed to do our American graffiti with this film. And and we waited and we waited and waited and it couldn't have come at a better time, ultimately. You know, now uh, the other question was, uh, OK, so why was it on Gary the Kurtz? Yeah, oh, Gary, Kurtz. Gary, so, Gary Kurtz. OK, so when I first when Stephen Spielberg first got Disney to pick up Martians, which became Space Invaders, because he saw it and loved it and called Jeffrey Katzenberg and said, you've got to release this movie. Just slap a touchstone title on it and put it out there. You're going to be fine. We, I, I suddenly became a little bit of a you know, celebrity. I was, you know, flavor of the month in premier magazine and, you know, and suddenly I'm getting all these interviews and my agency, you know, CAA is sending me out like I, you know, Fred Roos, who I met because of that movie took me out to breakfast one day and he, he looks at me and he says, your movie dollar for dollar has more production value in it than any film I've ever seen in my life. And you're going to tell me how you did it. <laughs> and then he goes, and, and I did. And he goes, okay, well, <clears throat> I want you to meet a friend of mine tomorrow for breakfast. 
uh, I'll, I'll, I'll call your agent and set up the, you know, the details. So I go, I'm driving home and I get a call from my agent, Jay Maloney at CNA and he, CAA. And he says, uh, you need to be at the Bel Air hotel tomorrow morning for breakfast with George Lucas. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> what? So I go and it's to, t to discuss my possibly directing radio land murders which they sent me the script for that day. And I read it that night and I went in and I had my ideas and my notes and it was supposed to be like a 15 minute get together with George. And it turned into like a two hour nerd fest between George and George and I just being dorks you know, about technology and what was, he was doing with, you know, the upcoming, you know, uh, young Indiana Jones and all this stuff. So, so, it, it, when it, and, and, and one of the things that happened was on my way to that breakfast, I said to myself, okay, there are two words you are not going to say within 30 minutes of each other. And those words are star and wars. Oh, no. <laughs> and I, I never mentioned Star Wars or this story or anything about it. We, I just went, said hello, talked about the script, and I got a call on the way home from the interview saying – that I was in a really good position because George was really impressed because I didn't talk about Star Wars, <laughs> which is, was the plan, you know? So, but you know, we, I, I, obviously I didn't end up directing Radio Land Murders, which I would like, would have liked to, but, um, but George apparently was impressed enough that he, that, that he said nice things about me. And years later, when my, very close friend John Knoll, who runs Industrial Light and Magic now, but we grew up together as model makers back in the 80s. Um, when my film was nearing being finished and George still owned Lucasfilm, um, there was a moment where Gary Kurtz had, Gary had talked to George and said, hey, we're going to do this movie. And George said, oh, that sounds fun. Cool. Let me know about it. And then at a certain point, we were going to a festival and we needed to know that we had the rights from Lucasfilm to show all of the Star Wars material that we have in the movie. And uh, but we couldn't find Gary. We were calling him up. We were calling him up and he lives in London or he lived in London and he uh, we couldn't find him. And finally, we, we found somebody who said, oh, yeah, he's in Siberia scouting locations for this movie about the Russian female fighter pilots, Night Witches. Great, great idea, by the way. And we couldn't get a hold of him so we're like what do we do so i called john noel and i said john can you ask george if it's okay for us to use this stuff and so john went over to the big house at the ranch with his laptop with a, a, a dvd of the film and showed george the pertinent sequences and said you know patrick would like to know if he can you know use this in his movie and george said hmm. and he watched it and goes i think the answer is yes and the next day, we got a letter from Lucasfilm giving us worldwide rights till the end of all time to all this material. It was, it was magical. I mean, just amazing. So those deals predated Disney acquiring Star Wars. Yes, Is that right? that's right. That's right. Okay, because right. I, I, I feel like there's just so much interest in this movie because, um, one, it's so relatable from the standpoint of so many people's lives were changed by the night they saw Star Wars. And the, the way you saw Star Wars was very different. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the way you saw it was different. But I will say that that feeling that, and when you brought up American Graffiti, I'm like, oh yeah, what does this movie remind me of? American Graffiti. American but Graffiti the, by way of, I mean, some people in the chat are mentioning Fablemans. Uh, this is way before Fablemans. So right. It's not, it's not, my, it's not that. My, I have three quotes and I'm just going to go for it. Okay, the first okay. quote is, if you see just one disaffected put upon nerd geek boy loner in his hometown trying to survive movie this year it should probably be the fablemans but if you see two <laughs> <laughs> yeah my my second one is um i am so honored that my hero steven now by the way i saw star wars 28 times in its first 30 days of release but i saw close encounters of the third kind 30 four times in its first 30 days of release 34 times in 30 days and I, but my my second quote is i am so honored that steven would go to all this trouble and spend all this money and all this time to make a prequel to my film 
<laughs> and the third well, it, one is yeah. the third one. The third one is is I cannot wait to see the Fablemans because he's my hero, and I can't wait to see that story told. But I'm going to have to delay it because I have to get into the time machine I've built to go back to 2004 to shoot my sequel. <laughs> it um, it, it really did capture this era because. When you, there's so many details in this movie that I just, you know, I mean, like Easter eggs and things like, like the dedication to 2001 A Space Odyssey. I was obsessed with that movie. I saved money and got a VCR to watch like 2001 A Space Odyssey on VHS. I yeah. read American Cinematographer. I read Starlog, Cinefantastic, Fantastic Films. I was obsessed with movie magazines and famous monsters. And I made my own little Super 8 movies when I was a kid. I mean, but the way that you do these recreations of shooting those movies is insane. I also loved Planet of the Apes. Like, the, the, that really, that era of sci-fi, people didn't know what a franchise was. No, no one said franchise. No one used words like IP or content, no. right? No. It was, I mean, look, if Disney was smart, they would buy your movie and put it on Disney Plus, um, and they should buy it for $200 million. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, but, please. <laughs> that would be great. But, but what I'm saying is, is you capture this era of there wasn't a lot back then, and everything no. that did come out was such a, such a high quality. Now I think we're kind of like, I almost think like there's there's a lot of bad stuff that's come out now. And I think to myself, well, could I even have imagined that there would be a She-Hulk TV show when I was reading the <laughs> Fantastic Four comics where She-Hulk replaces the thing? Like, And now it's like every month there's something. It's not like, you know, like those eras where it's just like there's maybe three science fiction movies or one opening in a year. And now we're yeah. kind of spoiled. There's a science fiction movie couple of months and then there's tv shows and and of varying qualities but you completely captured this era and also simultaneous with that era of like star wars and obsession with film it's also a coming of age story with yeah. um teens and and dealing with all of that and making big life choices that will affect like um look i also moved from the midwest i grew up in michigan um Royal Oak, you know, just, just oh, outside yeah. of Detroit. And oh, I, I ended up moving to the West coast and it was weird. And I had a girlfriend at the time and it was like this big dramatic thing. And I'm going, I'm watching your movie. And I'm like, there's so many moments that are so relatable. Not just the fact that like so many of us are, I mean, having this conversation now, why? Because we, you know, we saw star Wars when we were kids. I want, you we know, have a, Sorry, your comment, but we have so many questions for you. But uh, sorry if you have any comment on what I just ranted about. Well, so. I, it's, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, one of the things that happened over the course of the making of this movie is that people who either saw the trailer or saw the film in various iterations over the, you know, 18 years we were making it, um, I would get emails from people in Norway or or Tonga or, you know, Brazil or, you know, some, you know, Lithuania, whatever, people all over the world would, would email me and say, how did you know what it was like to be a teenager in my country? And I said, I didn't. I just knew what it was like to be a teenager, which made me feel both, uh, I, I mean, I was amazed and I was also really pleased that, that, that really what maybe the movie captures more than anything because it's not really about star wars at all star wars is a is a thing that's like a, a grail in the movie but it, i mean it's as much about stanley kubrick in 2001 space odyssey as it is about star wars it, it's it, it's more about that over the horizon glow that what's over there what's the undiscovered country of your of the possibility of your life that you either go towards or don't. And, and my whole mission was to say, go. Like my old friend Ray Bradbury used to say, jump, build your wings on the way down. You know, it, you get one shot at this, one chance. You have to jump. I, lo I love that quote, jump, build your wings on the way down. Um, we've got, we've got I, I have to say that that oh, sure. you, you brought up something that that because this movie felt very familiar to me, even though I'm this Asian kid from LA 
who, unlike you, I could drive to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> right. It, it, right. <laughs> yeah. And, but, but, you know, watching your movie is like, yeah, I don't know what it is because I've never lived where you, where this film was taking place, never lived your life, but it felt so familiar to me. And then that's what really drew me to ultimately the story. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. I, I, you know, it's interesting. You say I'm an Asian kid and it's funny because, you know, Linda, my girlfriend was half Japanese and a lot of people were like, are you going to make a big thing out of this? And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not, she, she's not in the movie. Emmy Chen, who does a beautiful job playing the role and, <laughs> and is so much like the original Linda that the original Linda was the one who helped me cast her because she saw her and said, that's her. Um, but that's, a, that's me. Um, I didn't, you know, uh, some people are like, oh, this guy cast an Asian girl to be his girlfriend as like a thing, right? Or, or like to be, you know, hip or it, she was just, that's who she was. I mean, my girlfriend was half Japanese. Her, her dad was a Korean war vet and her mom was literally from Osaka, you know, and it, it, it didn't occur to me to do anything other than just have her be who she was. And we didn't make it the point or try to make it a story issue. She was just the person I was in love with. It didn't, you know what I mean? And, it, and, I, and I, I hope that that's a positive thing that it wasn't like, you know, stunt casting. It wasn't trying to do something cool or, you know, or it was just real. Well, I, I think the, the reason people even bring it up is because there's such a focus on diversity and yeah. inclusion in movies today. And which is great, but- Which, which but is I, fine. It's always been like this. Like when you, if you go back and watch even old science fiction movies, it's like, well, there was a lot of diversity in those movies, except it wasn't focused on. So it wasn't a point of well, focus at all. I, and, and what's funny is that in the old days, like when I was doing Martians, which became Space Invaders, when we were casting it originally, I wanted Lindsay Price, if you remember Lindsay, mm -hmm. um, who, you, to, she, was, she was the best possible actress who had come in for the part. And the producers were like, oh, she's not, you know, we want a blonde haired, blue eyed. I was like, what are you talking about? She's awesome. She's amazing, and she's the right because I was blind to all of that. I didn't care. I just wanted someone good, and Lindsay was amazing. And I and and they they wouldn't have her. And that luckily, I mean, we ended up with with Ariana Richards, who was amazing. At, but that was after this huge fight I had with the producers about them not wanting to cast someone who was half Asian in the movie. And I, I was like, what? What do you? What does it matter? What are you thinking? You know, but I, you know, well, I like I like in the movie. It's really never brought up. It's mm -hmm. not no, really no, a, it's not it's a not a no, it's not. And it's it's just you would never bring it up in real life. That's the thing. right, exactly. Yeah. There was no yeah. discussion when I was a teenager with her about oh, you know, you're half Asian. You know, it, right. <laughs> nobody nobody I knew cared. I certainly didn't. It didn't it yeah. didn't register. You know, and it, to me. It was just this is appropriate and correct, and 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 Linda, the real Linda, was really delighted that we you know honored her as who she really was, you know. Let's um we have a bunch we have a couple super chats that are unrelated to this. Just want to let the audience know I'll get to those at the end of the show, um, but we do have a lot of comments and questions from people watching this live. So I'm gonna pop up as many as we have time for. Right here, so I'm let's in. Go. Let's go through it. So here we go. Sarone Games Go says, highly anticipating this movie. Yay. Brock <laughs> Samsonite says, the kid in the trailer looks familiar. So your lead well, actor. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. So the funny thing about John Francis Daly, because he's wonderful in this movie, is that he and I met two days before we started shooting. Because we had another very famous child actor, very famous child mm -hmm. actor, I'm not going to mention his name, who had already signed on to the film. Incredibly famous, but he was in his uh, all teeth and elbows stage of, of not being a child actor anymore. And, but, but that would have made him perfect. And um, about a week before shooting, we got a call from his parents saying, oh, we want half the profits of the film or he's not showing up. 
And I said, well, are you putting in half of the money? And they said, no. And I said, okay, well, then he, he's not showing up because we're not giving him half the profits of this movie that all these amazing crew members and artists and, and, and actors and everybody have signed on to for minimum wage to make something they believe in. So suddenly we're without our lead actor a week before shooting on a film that if it shuts down, it's just, it, it'll never start up again. You know that, right? So my extras casting director, Kat White, she goes, well, what about John Francis Daly? And I said, Sam Weir? He's like nine. He's like this tall. And he's, he's a goofy. Yet she goes, that was 10 years ago. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and so, so we sent the script to John. John read it, loved it. But we were like, what? I mean, I, okay. And he said yes. We said yes. And then he showed up for his costume and, 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 and you know, hair, we had to put a wig on him because as he would tell you, he's got something that he calls his Jufro, <laughs> which is like this little curly, curly hair thing that he's got going on his head that, 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 that wasn't going to work for the goofy, crazy haired guy I was in high school, right? So we wigged him, which by the way, the wig that we've got on John Francis Daly has been not only on John, but on all the doubles, extras, and even the kid at the beginning who plays him at eight, nine, ten years old, it's <laughs> the same right. wig. We used it for everyone, which the continuity of that actually is really fun, but it's also ridiculous. So, um, but John, John the, the amazing thing about John, who's you know obviously now a, an incredibly talented and su successful you know writer director as well, is that at the time since. I had to concentrate on directing a lot of young people that had never, they maybe acted a little bit or done some theater, but they weren't film people. Right. And there was, a, I had to do a lot of work with them in a great way. And they were all wonderful. John was a pro by this point because of, you know, freaks and geeks and everything. And so I didn't have any real time with him to discuss the character or you know, and by the way, it's me. And one of the things I decided early on was that I was not going to say, well, it's me. So therefore it should be like this. Or I would have, I wanted to treat this character as this like quantum mechanical being back in the past, who's still back there right now, if you believe in quantum mechanics, living this life, who would no more recognize himself in me now than he would anyone else. And I, so I left it to John to interpret the character based on the script. And one of the things John would do, and I didn't know this until I started watching the footage later, because we never had time to even watch dailies. There was no, no such thing. We, we banked it. And then later, after it was all done, we started looking at it, right? And I started looking at things that he had copied by watching me direct <laughs> Not and so when the other kids would run off between takes and you know party and have fun and goof around and go to the craft service table, John would stick around and he would just sit there and he would he would watch me and I didn't know this. People told me this later, and and what happened was he started adopting parts of me that I didn't know he was doing until I saw the footage later, and 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 so he did his homework while we were making the movie. And, and it just it added this level of realism and, and, and a level of character development that, that we couldn't have gotten without his attentiveness. You know, it's really wonderful. He's, he's an amazing actor, actually. Let's go through. There's a lot of comments, so I'll get okay. through as many as I can. Uh, the Joker says, damn, I'm sold. Uh, anyone that worked on Bill and Ted is okay in my book, says Goober. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, was fun. Juxta Jose says 52577 looks great. This movie looks like it can inspire people to get into filmmaking. We showed a rough cut at the Toronto Film Festival a bunch of years ago. It must have been 20, I don't know, 2012 or 2013. And this young kid comes up with his mother after the screening and he says, I've been trying to decide whether I want to become a director or not, but your movie con convinced me that I want to. And he goes, and my first movie is going to be about the night I saw your movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is very meta. Meta, meta, meta. meta. <laughs> uh, let's see. Turo says, this guy is terrific. 
He's reminding me of the positive prospect that Hollywood used to be. Great positivity. This interview, Chris, is why I'm glad Film Threat exists. Dave, thank you, Turo. Dave De Pietro says, I saw Star Wars 32 times back in 1977. The movie changed my life forever. I can't wait for this film. Uh, uh, Patrick dropping names like nukes in a good way. Talk about living life to the fullest, says C.D. <laughs> Stein 69. And John Orchard <laughs> says, thank you for the inspiration to keep pursuing our dreams. Uh, immortal... Remus says, will this film get a run in the UK? And if yes. so, please, please release it beyond London, even if it's just as a one-off, one-night only showings at local theaters across the UK. Mortal Remus is, is watching the show live from, from the UK. What, what, 101, what 101 Films in, in London is the European distributor. Um, and so they will be booking whatever happens in Europe. But I guarantee you, no matter what they do, and I'm hoping they're listening, and I'm hoping they'll they'll do some screenings that will help you. But even if, if for any reason that doesn't happen, I will personally book a screening in England that you can attend. I'm gonna do it. I promise. I, Patrick is very good about getting getting back on his emails. He's very good about email. He is. <laughs> Emails me like that. Solomon Thornton says, I always like seeing other people's experiences of seeing Star Wars. And then uh, Johnny Fuerte says, the trailer gave me Linklater vibes in a great way. Can't wait to see it. Where can we watch it? Well, it's, it's, it's available for pre-order on Amazon, um, which, and it comes out on November 22nd, uh, DVD and Blu-ray. Uh, and it's... It will work in any DVD machine in the world. Ooh, um, is it and, okay? It, it's it's then it's it's what do they call that? Gray market or it's like uh, but it's but, basically? But, oh no, but, I know what it is. It's region free. Region free. I, I so think I don't know. I don't, I don't know know that for yeah. a fact or anything. But anyway, um, <laughs> but, but the, the, the other cool yeah. thing is that um, uh, it then comes out on December fifteenth on Showtime. Oh, oh, nice, yeah. nice, and it oh, will be, and, and it will be in lots of other, you know, places and, and, and areas in the on the planet uh, uh, soon, and and I can't wait for you to see it. <laughs> and one final question here from Portland one eight two. Hi, Patrick. Can you talk about the replica models used in the film? The, that was the thing that kind of blew my yeah. mind. Like watching the movie, like I'm, I remember as a kid because I bought the Aurora model kits. I made those. I had the glow in the dark Godzilla. I have, and now today I have books of just the instruction manuals for all those Aurora model kits. You can actually buy it as a, a collected. Oh, collection of I, yeah, books. I, I have those. I have I, those. That's so funny. Yeah. Okay. So I have what's amazing is remember that I started out in Hollywood as a model maker in like mm -hmm. 1980, and so all of the great model makers in the world of, you know, film model making are old friends of mine, and I've worked for the greats. I worked for Douglas Trumbull and Mark Stetson and, and, and you know, and Greg Jean was a personal friend and he's in the movie, uh, obviously. Uh, I, and, and many of these people helped. Greg Jean loaned me the actual Devil's Tower miniature from Close Encounters and the act, that little model of the Close Encounters mothership, that little study model on Stephen's desk is the actual model that was on Stephen's desk. That, that Greg lent lent me, and 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 so when we when it came time to make the movie, we reached out to all these people, and we had people uh, that that came from all over the world. We had models literally from California to New York to, you know, Holland. I mean, we had uh, we our our our, our uh, land speeder came from a guy in Holland, right? I mean, and we. And, and our, our, our blockade runner was from a guy up in, like, you know, Modesto or Northern California. He built this thing in his garage, and we borrowed it and shipped it down to Chicago and shot it. I mean, uh, and, and, then, and then, like, the Death Star surface in, in the ILM sequence, we had one square piece, right, built that, that kind of set the scene, but we didn't have the whole Death Star surface. That was put in by John Knoll, 
who did it in his oh. spare time at his house. You know, I didn't even <laughs> and, notice that. And, and I was like, how did you do that scene? And I, I didn't realize it was digital. Yeah, no, so. and, and same thing with the Millennium Falcon, which was was we just had an empty box and a little, you know, <laughs> like tennis ball to, you know, and 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 John Knoll dropped in the Millennium Falcon, wow. you know, in that sequence, and we just had so much goodwill. I mean, like the cloud tank sequence when we're pulling back with, you know, to meet Stephen. Uh, the only thing we had was the frame of that tank and the guy holding the the Waldo mechanical arm, but. All it did, it, we had the thing that went up out of frame, but we didn't have the other ang uh, angle of the arm that went into the thing. That was all done by John Knoll and the clouds and the lights and everything and the water. That was all added by John, you know. And it, it wow. you know, we just had so many people who, who loved the script enough and, and believed in the story enough that they just said, "Yeah, I got this. I'm, I'm in." Well, um, I, I. I... We, we got to wrap it up, unfortunately, but um, I cannot thank you enough for spending time with us today. I know we had a mess up on the one time, but we got that was, that was my fault. <laughs> oh, whatever, it's all good. But a quick comment here from Cato Christopher Hagen says, Please come back on Film Thread, Patrick. Hollywood, anytime Hollywood needs this positivity. Good luck on any yeah. upcoming projects. So, thank, thank you for you. that. Patrick, uh, I can't wait uh, for the Blu-ray because uh, I, I love I love Blu-rays, and just like your movie is like reliving like one of the greatest like eras of uh, just when when all this stuff was new. Um, it's a different conversation now, but like that time was just so precious. And thank you for coming on the Film Threat thank live you. cast to chat I with us. I, I really appreciate you having me, and I appreciate Film Threat's reviews and. I'll be back anytime you guys want. We got lots to talk about. <laughs> yeah, great. Patrick, thanks again. Have a great rest of your afternoon. You too. Thanks. Good night, guys. Later. Bye. Bye.